I do encourage people to take improv classes because it does, the goal is to build confidence, to build teamwork, to build collaboration. And it was life-changing and can be life-changing. And I hear again and again, I'm still on faculty at Second City, uh, students will say this really changed my life. This really helped calm my nerves because I'm focusing on the audience instead of myself. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Well, you know, but I'm going to say anyway, I am fantastic. Excellent. Glad you're here. Yes, I am. (laughs) Question for you. Yes. In your time in the industry... You've worked in many theme parks. You've had a lot of interactions with guests over the years. Can you think of any, or maybe any instance where you tried to maybe implement something into your routine just to test it out and it completely fell flat? Yes, I can. So back when I worked at Canopy Lake Park, like one of my first couple of seasons, I was the sort of the assistant lead. And I got to walk around and do breaks. So I had some free time that I was not always tied up on a ride. And I used to take a broom Mm. and hold it like a guitar. And I would go up to people and I would ask for requests, right? No matter what they said, I sang Blue Suede Shoes by Elvis. (laughs) And some people were like, request for what? Like they, they didn't get that I was, I was taking a request for a song to play. Um, so in those instances, like that, that sort of fell flat with some people, but some people really got into it. Mm, okay. Or was anybody like annoyed with you or like, what are you talking about? Like I'm they, they were kind of like, they were, cause, cause I, I would approach people as they were in line. Right. So mm. they were waiting. So they were kind of a captive audience. Um, and some people were like, and this was before cell phones. So they didn't have any, you know, they didn't have a cell phone to kind of, you know, ignore me with. Um, right. but some were like, just like kind of looking at me like I had three heads. And so I moved on quickly from them. And, um, and then I found the people that would engage. Ah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Do you have an example of something that fell flat? Yeah. So I was thinking, uh, while we were doing this amazing interview with with Heather and talking about kind of improvising, particularly with with guest service interactions, for some reason, what came to mind was the very first, not of many, but the very first guest complaint I ever got, and it was while I was as I was a ride operator at Millennium Force at Cedar Point. It was my very first summer in the industry, and it was a really busy night. And I was at the entrance to the ride and we normally had two people staffed at entrance, but we were in the middle of a rotation. So I, I kind of had this solo 10 minutes to myself or so. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, the line was an hour and a half long and a whole bunch of people were flooding the entrance. And I'm trying to, I'm looking out for loose articles and guests who I need to ask the, to try the test seat and uh, guests who might be below 48 inches. So I've got all these things going in my mind. And I felt like so many people were coming up to me asking me how long the wait time was when I was standing right next to the, the wait time sign, but it's an hour and a half. Yeah. And people were like, how long's the wait? Is it an hour and a half? Is that sign right? Is it really an hour and a half? And something clicked in my mind to say, you know what, this will be kind of funny. And I picked up the microphone and I said, attention guests approaching, the wait time is currently an hour and a half. If the wait time said four hours, you should bring a meal with you because you'll be waiting four hours. <laughs> if the wait time said two weeks, you should probably bring a sleeping bag because you will be waiting two weeks to ride. Right now, the sign says an hour and a half. So you will be waiting an hour and a half. And I will never forget the look of the guests. I, the last one who walked up out of maybe 400 or so, yeah. who looked at me glaring. And about 10 minutes later, I received a phone call from the park operations office (laughs) learning that they had complained about that particular. (laughs) I remember thinking, you know what? 
let's not implement that into my routine because it did not go as planned. Do you think there was anybody that could have heard you that actually liked it? I'm sure there were hundreds. There were yeah. so many people around. They must have laughed so hard. In fact, I am sure if they had all gone to the park operations office, the amount of guest compliments I would have gotten from that would have <laughs> drowned out that one complaint. Yeah. You know, I never thought of it that way, actually. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the big lessons that we take away from Heather, right? And, and by the way, Heather Barnes, uh, the founder and director at Improv at Work, also a uh, an alum of the attractions industry, a, a veteran of the attractions industry is, is our guest today. And she incorporates a lot of improvisation activities in what she does at various corporations. And now she runs her own company called Improv at Work. And what we're just talking about there is that there could be things that we do that might be guest interaction, that might be employee interaction, that might completely fall flat for some people. They may not like it at all, but there could be other people who really, really do. And so part of, I think, one of my big takeaways from this is keep trying, right? Keep, keep trying those things. Yes, that person went to park operations and said, this guy on the microphone, he probably shouldn't be on the microphone. Get him out of here. But he'll never amount to anything in the industry, right? And here I am on a microphone. That's right. <laughs> Saying whatever you want. Um, but I think the, the, the lesson there is that there's probably going to, probably even more people that did appreciate it, but they didn't actually go say, hey, you know, park operations folks, this guy, Josh, he should be on the mic all the time, right? But I'm sure there was a lot of people who enjoyed it. Personally, if I heard that, you know, being in kind of a fun environment, I think I would have thought it was funny. Thank you. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm so glad to get validated. It's like so many years later. After <laughs> But like you said, we're chatting with Heather Barnes today uh, from Improv at Work. And what's really cool about this conversation is when you think of improv, you normally think of it as, as a form of entertainment. Uh, you know, Heather is uh, uh, from Chicago, so she's done work with Second City. You think of going to Second City to see improv, and it is a, a, an evening of comedy, evening of fun. Uh, so how do you connect the dots between that and organizational effectiveness and, and performance and even the way that people are hiring or auditioning for their jobs, I, we get into so many different, very specific practical applications that improve the overall effectiveness from the business. And that could be in terms of guest experience. It could be in terms of employee experience. She talks about how this directly ties to improving employee morale, which then improves retention and creates an overall better workplace. So um, it's, it's, we have a fun conversation. We play games. We actually get into some of the activities that she talks about, and then we talk about why they're so important and what it was that we were thinking about. And uh, overall, this is a, you know, we just, we just have a great episode ahead of us. So are you ready to jump into this conversation with Heather? Yes, and let's do it right now. Hey, Heather, welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast. We are so excited to finally have you on the show. How are you today? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. It is something I've been looking forward to, and it's great to see your smiles. <laughs> Likewise. Uh, so Heather, to get this kicked off, can you give us a quick intro? Tell us a little bit about who you are, as well as improv at work. Sure, thanks. I am Heather Barnes, and I've been a director at the Museum of Science and Industry uh, for about 10 years. And then I was a director at the John G. Shedd Aquarium for about four years. And in both roles, part of my work was helping transform the way we engage guests to be more participatory and more inclusive and to have more conversation based learning. So instead of just having a presentation or a lecture, how do we make things more dynamic and include visitor voices? And that's been a lot of fun. I have loved so much of that work and I've been able to see when that work is implemented well, the transformation and the impact. And it's incredibly rewarding and, um, and inspiring to see that shift. Um, I started in private work when I was, uh, teaching at Second City and teaching some of the philosophies that I used at MSI. And I was asked to come and work and do workshops for STEM professionals at the University of Chicago. And they offered to pay me. And so I said, yes, and. 
Um, and then I went to MSI and said, can I do this on the side? And they said, yes. I also went to Second City. I said, can I do this on the side? Because at the time I was on faculty and I wasn't sure because it was using blends of all of these things. I wanted to make sure I was being um, ethical and full of integrity. And Second City was like, yes, no one owns improv. Please go and use these philosophies to help others better engage. And so I started in private work in 2014. It was called something different at the time. I formally LLC'd in 2017, but I've been leading workshops internationally since 2014. And it varies quite a bit if it's doctors or lawyers or faculty at universities or scientists. I take philosophies of improvisation and apply them, uh, even in theme parks with leadership and executive coaching and guest engagement and uh, championing large scale teams and motivating people to be their most authentic self. So th there's a, a number of things. That was a really long answer, which is also what I practice to not do. So I'm already <laughs> violating some of my first few <laughs> rules of thumb. But on a podcast, Heather, long answers are really good. So. <laughs> Feel free. Keep keep <laughs> yes ending yourself. That'd be that'd be great. Um, okay, can you tell us? Ahead. Can you tell us a little bit more about the application of that? Like, I remember seeing those workshops in in practice at MSI, and just the energy and the engagement, and then sort of the the business outcome of of where that all led to. Yeah, I think in, in, in integrating these strategies is not always easy, particularly when we started back in two thousand and six. I would get some pushback. Um, you know, this isn't improvising. You know, we're not improvising to be funny or on Saturday Night Live. We're not doing um, two person long form scenes. We're using the philosophies and the techniques of improvisation. And we're doing a series of exercises together in a group or in pairs to make our skill set stronger and to enhance our ability to respond in the moment and to accept different voices or audience voices or to be positioned to uh, become participatory. And so we, it, was, it was a big transformation in several areas. You can apply, I've applied improvisation in a number of techniques, whether it's communicating in um, multidisciplinary fields of medicine. So pathologists talking to cytologists or, or um, um, lab techs. In the Museum of Science and Industry, we used it to hire people. So anyone can tell you in a one-on-one -on -one interview that they're great with people. People, 20 people, you begin to see the teamwork unfold. You begin to see how people are supportive and how they're helpful to one another versus they're quick to blame uh, if something goes wrong. You see how they adjust in the moment to things changing or directions that are unclear. And so using improv to audition, I found allowed us not only to, to get in more people in a shorter amount of time, but also set the tone for the culture and assess the skill sets more quickly. Um, so, so those are two different applications of improv techniques and philosophies and exercises. And so at MSI, we used, we were very integrated. We used um, improv in our morning meetings and that gave ownership to more of the facilitators that were hired. It used to be, when I first got there, one leader lecturing everyone on the day-to-day -day activities. And this became more of a time for us to get together and practice our science skill sets or our communication skill sets, our improvising. It became a time to allow for other people to talk about shows they're in or make fun announcements and it shifted from a top-down approach to more of a collective morning meeting approach where everybody was sharing. And, and that was really powerful to, to see. People would start mornings laughing with one another, helping one another out, um, engaging. Uh, and so practicing those essential skill sets they were going to use all day in this safe environment. Um, so that was another application, using them in morning meetings. We also use them in some of our trainings. And there were a variety of applications um, for improv in the work environment. I hope that sounded clear. So auditions, communications, engaging guests, team meetings, trainings, 
And the business impact was quite transformative. It took time. It took a lot of change management, um, but the outcome was awesome. I used to have to, when I first started, say, uh, Matt would come and complain to me about Josh. I'm not going to work on his team. He has attitude problems. And over time, research- Sounds about right. Yeah. Pardon? <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> Sounds about right. Exactly. Josh, I hear that about you all the time. Uh, research indicates if you're playing games with one another, you're more likely to help them out. You're more likely to understand their default state, their physicality, um, their mannerisms. And so that went away. I, I, you know, that we weren't perfect. We still had problems, but the number of times that I had to talk through personal conflicts was diminished over time. It was really nice. Again, we still had issues. We still had things that we needed to work through, but the impact of teamwork, collaboration, support, guest engagement went up, the nature and how people approached engaging guests went up. It's, it's so cool. And I learned some of this at IAPA, treat your, treat your teams the way you want your teams to treat your guests. So if we were providing a fun environment up front the message was clear that that's the environment we want our team members to work with our guests. And, and we saw that take shape. People asked open-ended questions. They got the visitor voice in. Um, they had laughable moments with guests. They had a positive guest experience. Instead of yelling at people coming up the escalator with a cup of coffee, um, we were able to turn some of these experiences into a positive one. So, hey, that looks like great coffee. Help finish it here. Uh, let's pound it before you move on. You know, there were just different ways to say the same kind of message um, instead of yelling up and running someone climbing on an exhibit we would approach them and say like hey there let's let's all stand here and take a picture and be safe first instead of screaming at people so there were just so many outcomes I would say in short which is not the goal <laughs> of the podcast um, stronger team collaboration a more positive work environment um, and again, it wasn't perfect. However, instead of coming in every day and having leaders say, be here on time, be here on time, which is negative because you're yelling at the people that are in the room that are on time. It was um, putting everybody's name in a hat that had perfect attendance and giving them award and celebrating their achievement. And so it's focusing on the same rule or business need, but in a positive way rather than a punitive way. Um, and so those outcomes from an employee standpoint were more positive engagement cards were awesome. And I could talk about this for hours, but we get, we got all of this unsolicited feedback over the, um, eight years we had implemented these that guests were seeing exactly what we set out to do and commenting pos positively about it. And, and I've saved a lot of those guest comment cards, um, and I use them in presentations to show some of those outcomes. Um, it was really nice. I talked with MSI before I left and, um, and they, they said that I could hang on to some of that. And I think it's really valuable feedback again, because it's unsolicited feedback. Um, thank you. Our, our guide was fun and encouraged questions and helped redirect answers that maybe didn't make sense. And to me, that's um, an outcome of some of the improv strategies and some of the work that we did to prepare our team members to be positioned to handle those situations. So from those guest comments that you've collected, are there any that stick out in your mind of particular situations that I would say come to mind of being exemplary of, of everything that you said we set out to do and this is what the guest is seeing uh, that really just ties it all together? Yeah, they would come in, you know, in terms of thinking of one specific, the one I just read in a workshop I was leading with the Desert Botanical Gardens on. Um, in Phoenix, Arizona last week. Um, they thanked, and it's the same things that I said, my son learned so much when he answered something like volcano about greenhouse gases, the facilitator turned that in to a comment that made sense and helped redirect his answer. So he felt good about his incorrect answer. And we all as a group learned so much. Um, that's a really powerful one because learn, fun, questions. Those are things that we set out to do with our visitors and our guests to increase engagement, to increase science learning. It's not just to engage, to engage. There are specific reasons why we're moving in this direction, hopefully to inspire people 
to become scientists, to see themselves reflected in the work that we do, to see themselves as scientists or marine biologists or conservationists at SHED. And when those comments were made about that, where, and again, you said one, but they would come in multiple a week. And it was really cool to see that outcome. Heather, you've uh, mentioned the word inclusivity and safe a couple times, and I want to see if we can go a little deeper into those because I think that's something that a lot of employers are talking about right now, right? And and should have been talking about them for a long time is being inclusive to all of their team members and guests, and you know, giving their team members a very safe space to come into. You know, the the you know the outsider's view of an improv activity might be, I don't feel safe, like I don't feel saying <laughs> yes and or you know getting myself, you know, throwing something across the room. Um, yeah. But the the result is that you do create a safe space and people do feel inclusive. So can you talk a little bit more about how that, how that actually happens in those situations? Sure. Uh, first of all, in every experience that you create in which you're using improv, I, I think that immediately establishing a safe space and we're just looking for you to participate. We're not looking for you to be the most funny person in the room or to be on Saturday Night Live. We're just looking for you to focus on the group and to participate. And then starting with something very basic that allows everyone to participate and succeed very quickly. So I am a big fan of whether it's an audition with 50 people we're immediately setting it up and saying and setting expectations. This is a safe space. We want you to um, be your best, have fun with this. Um, so we rare, you, you would not see us walk into a room and be like, okay, everyone act like a pair, be your best pair. That's I think what people are afraid of. And we talk about why we're about to do the activity. So, so we start with um, as leaders creating a very safe space. And I just did this with a science communication workshop um, last week. It's about being articulate that this is a safe space for everyone. And in order to create that, we all need to, to do this and to be comfortable being uncomfortable and increase our, our skill sets together. So I think that's super important. And I love that you said safe and inclusiveness. I, I think that's one more cool evolving application of improv. There are many exercises where you have to listen to understand, not to respond and paraphrase back what you've heard and use other people's voices and make sure that you're understanding it accurately and conveying the message in your own voice. Another cool part of improv is that even if we all try to mirror and do something like go, wow, every one of our wows is going to be a little different and it's going to be unique to each of us and emphasizing that in the work environment is really important. I've tried, and this is an area I'm still growing to uh, listen. And then particularly in a virtual meeting, say like, Matt, it sounds like you're really wondering how we can use improv to create more safe, inclusive environments. Uh, and just doing that is is a, a basic improv exercise. Again, listening to understand, not to respond. That I think is leaders, we can all do more of that. And so I'm trying to think even more forward, thinking about how to apply those components because it does come up into every single conversation that we have. Even now, I'm teaching at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern, and. I'm thinking about how even in working with business executives, how important it is to get other voices heard and acknowledged and stated in a boardroom or in a meeting or in passing. And how do we do that in a way that continues to make people feel safe and supported and understood? And that's that's not easy. And it's not easily just fixed with implementing improv in your work environment. That There's a number of things going on there. But what's cool about it is it's also based on a very fundamental core of improv, which is being accepting of whatever's thrown out mm -hmm. at you, whatever your audience says, whatever your scene partner says, and listening and, and helping make that make sense and um, understood. How does one uh, really strengthen their proficiency in these skill sets? I imagine that uh, kind of going through the activity once sort of kind of gets the ball rolling, but really being able to kind of 
build those muscles towards these, these improv type skills in whichever type of activity and whichever type of setting that it's in you, given the, the wide range of from executive coaching to, you know, the, the employee who, or the, the employee candidate who's auditioning for the role and the guest engagement. So mm -hmm. I, I guess how, how long does it take and what does that process look like of being able to, to get more and more proficient? You know, practice makes perfect and no one becomes a strong communicator or the perfect fit overnight. You have to keep doing these things in a variety of different environments. And even when I'm leading uh, activity or improvising, I'm learning and tweaking and I can get immediate feedback if I failed at setting up an activity because no one's doing it correctly. That's not a, 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 an effect of the room not doing it correctly. I failed at, at explaining something. And so I love doing this work because I'm constantly working on the skill sets in which I think, you know, we can all, we all need to improve. So it's really fun. Um, I also think being creative, I do encourage people to take improv classes because it does, the goal is to build confidence, to build teamwork, to build collaboration. And it was life-changing and can be life-changing. And I hear again and again, I'm still on faculty at Second City, uh, students will say this really changed my life. This really helped calm my nerves because I'm focusing on the audience instead of myself. So I do think there are so many wins in improv classes. I also encourage people in almost every workshop I do to take these exercises and play them with your friends and family or play them with others, create environments where you can get feedback. Even if it's not playing an improv game, how can you take a three minute talk and get feedback on it from someone else? Um, my partner and I take long hikes and he always likes to play the alphabet game. And even though I do that all the time for work, uh, I jump in and try and do that because I know that's going to build my skill set. And so it's looking at improv as a way to communicate authentically and to be collaborative in, in, uh, on an ongoing basis. So I don't think it's just like, you know, you take this one workshop and you're done and that's you're proficient now. I think too, when you take improv classes or experience them, depending on what's going on in your life at, at, at the time, applying what you're experiencing and what you're learning will evolve with the things, with the leadership skills that you're trying to evolve too. And so just as though Matt was talking about creating a safe space and an inclusive environment, how can I do that even better? Even though I might be doing the same improv experiences or exercises, what does that look like for this skill set that I'm working on? And how does that differ? So that was again a, a long answer, but I, <laughs> I think it's taking classes, working on it with your friends and family, and being mindful of what skill sets you're looking to improve and how you can improve them. Awesome. Awesome. And and Heather, we love the debrief you're doing with your answers as well. So you're going back and recapping and debriefing. So we we sincerely appreciate that. Um <laughs> Can, Helps can tie you, it all together. It's right. It's right. Well, it's, it's what she does. It's why she's so successful. Um, can you maybe walk us through uh, an activity? I know, you know, a lot of people have gone virtual with their meetings and things like that. Yeah. And I know you, you do this for, or for virtual um, meetings as well. Um, can you kind of give people a flavor of what it is you're actually talking about by going through an activity with us? Yes. And would you like to do this now as a group? Yes. Or yes. would you like to just hear about you the tell activity? us? Yeah, you tell. Yeah. One of my favorite, most basic exercises, so many came to mind when you said that, but one that I think is very easy to set up and very easy to succeed is just the alphabet exercise. And so we may have played this before. The three of us can do this. Uh, you can also put people into breakout rooms into pairs. It's one of the exercises I do earlier in workshops to help make a few points that are really important. And all we're going to do is we'll get a suggestion and then we'll have a conversation, but we need to respond to one another in the order of the alphabet. So I'll start and my sentence will start with the letter A and I'll say something about our topic. Josh will then go next and he'll respond to what I've said, starting with the letter B. And then Matt, you'll respond to what Josh said with the letter C, and we'll continue to go around in the order of the alphabet. This is called the alphabet game or the alphabet exercise. And we can go through now and showcase how it's um, played or participated in. And then we can do a little debrief if that works. Yeah, for okay. sure. So let's get a suggestion of anything at all. It could be Starbucks or the pandemic or... Ooh. 
This is when you chime in. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now I'm already thinking of Clearly we're thinking with B, because I know that's where I'm at. So maybe I'm thinking too far into it already. Yes, you <laughs> right? are. That's actually part of the debrief. We as humans excessively pre-plan to set us up for success. And it's about how do we stay in the moment, which is really hard to do. So nice, nice. That's what we call a self-edit, nice self-edit. Right. Yeah. Josh, really good. <laughs> um, right. how about ice cream? Perfect. Is that, is, is that is that a good enough topic? Uh, any that's also what's awesome about improv any suggestion is a good topic okay. I, I do have to say provided it's work appropriate in some settings but that rarely comes up <laughs> so i'll go ahead and start are, are there questions on what we're doing here or how we're going to do this so we're maintaining the category and we we're constructing a, a narrative that flows together sure and okay. we don't have to stick to ice cream if we find that by listening to one another the conversation evolves, that's okay, but it's most important to respond to the person right before you. So Matt's not gonna necessarily say something I talked about. He's gonna really try and listen to what Josh is saying and respond to that. And, and we're doing a sentence, right? It's not just a word? Okay. Yes, 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 good, good. See, this gives me feedback. I could have done an even better job <laughs> explaining what I was looking for. And this is why I love this work because you have to stay in the moment and figure out what you're doing well and where you're failing. Okay, are we ready? Yes. Okay. A day to have ice, a, a good day to have ice cream is on a hot, hot summer day. Before eating ice cream though, on this hot, hot summer day, it's good to take a dip in a cold, refreshing swimming pool. Can I tell you the combination of a nice swim and an ice cream cone is the best way to spend a summer day? Do you spend most of your summer days doing those kinds of things? Even though I do, <laughs> occasionally I will not have the ability to go swimming. So I just wake up and eat ice cream. Yeah. For me, it's really about taking into account what that day is going to be about. And is this a swimming day? Is this an ice cream day? Or is it a both day? Good analysis. It sounds like you think long and hard about which activity you're going to do given the kind of day you're about to have. I just try and do both every single day. Have I ever told you what my favorite flavor of ice cream is? I don't think you have. Jamaican butternut cream. That has <laughs> got to be it, right, Josh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. My, that sounds like a really good, good idea to, to, to have right now. Not really. In most of the country, it's very cold outside. Oh, but here in North Carolina, it's sunny and beautiful. People everywhere are getting ice cream cones left and right. The lines are so long, you can't even get a good ice cream cone in an hour. Quick, line up now to get your ice cream before it's all gone. <laughs> nice scene. Great job. Woo, great job. Yay. We got the queue. That's pretty darn good. Um, awesome. So what kinds of skill sets? What was going on there? I'll be honest, I forgot we were recording a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> People are listening to this, right? <laughs> listening to this nonsense. So I think it was it was concentration. It was really listening and being in the moment. Yeah. Absolutely. It, and we were playing it pretty safe and supporting one another and having good clear sentences and we stuck to ice cream. It's really interesting when you see groups go to crazy town and they're totally building on one another's ideas, which is also cool. Um, Josh, what did you find yourself doing? Uh, definitely thinking of what my next letter was after I said, I'm like, all right, and then Matt, then Heather, then me again, and then trying to follow the narrative and then thinking, what's a, what's a safe first word? that I can do if, if nothing else fails, if I can't think of anything else. Um, and then it worked out nicely that you were talking about hurrying up when you were right before Q. And then that led me into being able to say, oh, quick, that, you know, that ties in and also follows the, follows the story and follows the rules that, that are in place too. Nice. There was so much to unpack in that answer. I loved it. One is that you're 
thinking of the content, or in this case, the content's the alphabet. And anything, we could all just recite the alphabet again and again and again. But when we have to take in someone else's voice and we have to provide content and maybe an order in which we weren't pre-planning, it becomes more challenging. So when we're truly listening and truly paying attention to someone else, the content, which we know inside and out, it, it can be more difficult, but that's an important skill set. It's different than reciting. I'm asking you to engage with one another with a set of rules or a set of content, which is vastly different than just memorize and share the mm -hmm. alphabet. And so memorizing and sharing science content or memorize and sharing your leadership mes message to executives or to your staff or memorizing a set of um, rules, we got that. But when we're starting to engage with our audience and saying something like, hey, what do you think might be good safe rules around this part of the museum? And hearing from our audience and then going into maybe some of those rules or safety procedures, or if that's not the best example, if you are um, talking about science content or talking about even a, a, a task or a project you're working on, making sure that the person is with you and that they are listening and using what they think is the right piece um, and, and going back and forth. It's also a nice exercise for 50-50 airtime. So it's not just me reciting the alphabet, yeah. but we're all getting our own voice in there. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is, it, particularly within our industry, there are so many staff positions that there is some sort of structure and in, and in many cases, a script around. If you look at like sales, if someone who is uh, you know, in the box office or cashier or admissions, uh, many, many times I've seen of uh, in place where here is the script, where you say yes. this, the guest says this, and learn yes. to respond to every single one of those things. Yes. And it feels like it's rote memorization and almost becomes formulaic, which at the same time strips out any personable element yes. of it that could also be damaging to that interaction, which in this case is a transaction. So it's using the script or at least the framework that's being built around that, but saying, hey, you need to infuse your personality. And when you do, in that particular instance, you're actually going to sell more. You're going to sell more exactly. members, sell more tours. Our right. training has to put prompts to, to make it personal, to use your own voice, to make it yourself. I try early on to just get away from scripts altogether and use outlines. And there are pros and cons to that approach. And uh, when you put those things and make a personal connection with, with a guest, if they're wearing a Purdue t-shirt and I went to Purdue university undergrad saying boiler up, you're in luck today. You were having a boiler maker special, you know, which is actually drink, but they're just fun ways that you can connect with someone that we skip because we're so much in sticking to delivering the content and we've got it train for and integrate those personal connections first. I love this. I learned this in the IAPA industry. Gone is the day where you just mission. The audience has to see themselves reflected. More and more today, people want to see a personal connection. They demand a personal connection. They expect you to uh, facilitate some kind of personal connection with the content. And getting the audience voice out is, is just so important. And using improv is one way you can do that. I noticed, Heather, one of the things that I was doing was, like Josh said, I was trying to figure out what the next letter was, yeah. and that 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 kind of consumed part of my thought process, but then also, again, to Josh's point, like once I figured out what that letter was, then, you know, you might have been talking, and I was trying to maybe anticipate a little bit of what Josh was saying, but I still had to listen, right? Yeah. I, I couldn't fully, you know, just come up with my own thing, because I didn't right. know if that's the way Josh was going to take it. right. You can't pre-plan everything and we want to pre-plan everything, which is what's contributing to this culture of I'm going to answer your question before you ask it. And I know what I think you're trying to say. And then that immediately discounts for the other person that you're hopefully engaging with. I also get asked all the time, what about when you're with 900 people? How do you get that voice? It's not that we would play this exercise or do this with 900 people. But it's um, about thinking about the experience differently instead of me just doing a presentation, even if I'm getting my audience to vote by raising their hand or standing up and doing a, a penguin waddle or asking a group, you know, this section over here, what do you think about this or getting a couple of voices in, even if I just get a answer from Matt and I share that 
that makes the entire group feel like this experience is completely personalized to them because it's different. Acknowledging things that go on in the environment. If a beluga whale jumps three times instead of two or makes a bigger splash, how do we acknowledge that in the moment instead just of reciting our lines? How do we truly build that and make these things the experience, not just my content? And that's a big industry shift that we, I think, need to even do more of. Mm. Yeah. Um, so first I'll say, I was recently asked to do a penguin waddle about a week and a half ago when I was <laughs> at Shed with my son, 13 months old. He went nuts. He loved it. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. but did you? Oh, did I love it? Yeah. Absolutely. Did you waddle? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Probably, probably could have could have done a little bit better with it. But uh, um, a, a question that I have then, and maybe this is maybe this is more more personal, but I'd say over the last 232 weeks or so, I have tried to continually improve and enhance my podcast interviewing skills, and I feel like improv can play a huge role in that. We do I, I set out, you know, a, you know, a, a list of questions, as you know, even though we're doing an interview on improv, we still put together a list of questions as well to, to get it started, but thinking of, well, we also want to make sure that the, the conversation flows naturally. Are there any tips or guidelines that you have for us to be able to implement some of these indoor interviews? Totally. And you're doing it now. It's super active listening, building on what someone says. You sent a list of questions. I'm sure we haven't gotten to half of them because you're listening to some of the answers and building on what I'm saying and drilling down based on what's important to you. And, and, and I love that. In this participation piece, when it's conversation-based, people learn more when it's more of a conversation. And with this participatory element, people retain more when they're participating. So we're not doing it just to do it or to make people look funny when they're waddling. It's because they retain the content, they retain penguins, they retain the shed experience more. And so how do we drive that in a way that allows for people that don't want a penguin model or just want a little bit participate, but those that are like, yeah, I love this penguin model uh, and support both groups. Um, I think tips that you're, you know, being aware that, that that's what's going to be fun and being in the moment. That's what's going to be fun, right? I'm sure you've had the podcast where things go into crazy town or things uh, catch you off guard. And so it's, it's how do you harness and have fun with those moments? Or when a guest just keeps talking and talking and talking. Like, is that what like, I'm doing? I no, feel no, like you're I'm doing, doing that. No, yes. you're not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Love I it. feel love, like these are it. really long answers, which when I work in communicating with the media, what are your sound bites? How can you distill your message? And I'm like giving these long winded PhD paper. Right. We'll, we'll create the sound bites. You just yeah. give us the Thank full you. answer. Yeah. We'll take, we'll take care yeah, of it. Is this edited? <laughs> not at all. I think we just found our sound bite, by, by the way. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. Can we edit this? No. On the spot. <laughs> just in the self, moment. It's a self edit, right? It's a self um, edit. Yes. Yeah. Like, pause myself. Yeah. So actually, one like thing. Like Matt's frozen I, now. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I back now? Yes. Good. One thing I'm curious about, just because. Um, you know, you and I have talked about improv a lot. I've used some improv in, in my workshops and things um, like specifically about that, like that ABC activity, right? If you're doing that with a group, maybe like you mentioned before, that might have difficulty communicating. Do you use uh, the topic of they're having difficulty communicating or do you use a completely different topic just to show the, the technique? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, I want to make sure I'm answering the question correctly. Um, so you're saying like, if, if a given group is having a hard time communicating, do I dress it head on and say like, hey, Josh and Matt, we're having a hard time communicating. Let's let's get in the room and hammer that out. Uh, it, it depends. I would probably first do, is this an individual thing or a team thing? Like if the team needs to work on, like there was a point where we were like kicking people out. It was the holidays, everybody wanted to go home. And so we were aggressively like kicking people out of the um, museum or aquarium. So we, we did some exercises as an entire group. How can we positively message it's time to go? Anything goes. Free ice cream in the, um, we're talking a lot about ice cream today. Free ice cream in the lobby. We'll give you $500, the first person out of here. All these fun ways. But then we found some really nice nuggets of things we could say positively and all of that nonsense that then the team could use. But bigger, more importantly, they were like, all right, we got to positively message this. That's, that's the importance. So Sometimes we do hit it head on like that. 
um, if it's an, a, a person to person thing, I, I probably handle it a different way, but absolutely. I am often hired to come in and someone will say our exhibits department and our education department are not collaborating well and the marketing department, everyone has their own objectives. How can we increase communication and collaboration? And so I take that and I say very clearly, like part of what we need to do in um, completing this project is better communication collaboration. And so let's do some exercises here that emphasize that. And then hopefully, uh, you know, we'll debrief it together and they'll be able to apply this, the technique to the project at hand or what they're trying to achieve. Um, and we draw that out together. We make analogies and metaphors based on the exercise to, to the work that's going on and how we might better improve. So I think, yes, and I kind of gave a couple answers. Yeah, no, that was that was great. Thank you. So a, a couple things that I that I took away from that is uh, really being able to kind of reflect on the way you've communicated previously, whether it's internally with you know between departments and team members, or if we use the guest engagement from that standpoint, and, and being able to determine that really didn't work. There wasn't really a, a great response from that, and then that actually worked really well. And you try mm -hmm. it again and say, oh, that worked well again. And there's almost like this this feedback loop. Yeah. that then I would see that as turning improv into something that is now just part of my natural flow and routine, right? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm not sure I got it. <laughs> Meaning, I mean, I, I'm constantly adjusting. Some activities will work really well for some and, and some bomb. And I'm like, yep, that didn't work. And I call it out in the moment. And I'm trying to call more out in the moment when I fail all of the time because there's new research on you know being vulnerable and human and breaking down barriers and, and we as a society put so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect and communicate perfectly but I just so being a failing I think I failed to understand what you mean by <laughs> address uh, it becomes part of your standard routine Sure. So a uh, little while ago, we were talking about the guests coming up the elevator who've got a coffee oh, cup and, yeah. and say, all right, it's time to, you know, uh, pound that coffee down. Well, maybe they, they try that once and the guest, you know, looks up and be like, hey, jerk, don't talk to me that way. Yeah. Or yeah. the guest is like, oh, uh, you're funny. And I just learned something about a policy that I, I now yeah. need to implement. Yeah. That team member can take that and say, okay, when I see that, that yeah. another guest with a coffee cup, I'm now going to do the exact same yes. thing. It's not part of the script, but now it's part of my natural yes. flow that yes. my personality shines with it. It started yes. out as improv. Now it's regular. And now I feel even a little bit better at my job. Yes. Me. Okay. I love that you helped clarify that. Thank you. Because two cool things from IAPA. First is this past expo, I had um, the privilege to interview a chief marketing officer of Southwest Airlines. Now, for any of you that have flown Southwest Airlines, they integrate a ton of humor into their safety protocols, into flights successfully all the time. I asked him about this. He's like, we don't hire funny people. We don't try to be funny. We empower people to try their own things. And if they don't work, we talk about why it didn't work. Yeah. I find the same thing to be true. Nine times out of 10, it's going to be funny and it's going to be work and it's going to work and you're going to build on that and evolve it, but it won't work with every single person every single time. And it's how do you adjust given that? The second example at IAPA, and Matt, you were at this session, there is a group um, with Ryan Stanta and they use some improvisational exercises as well. They talk about training talent and exceeding expectations by empowering people to, to use their own voice and to have fun with the content, whether it's a roller coaster ride. Um, and they as well um, emphasized uh, being in the moment, doing something physical and how this one guest was like super physical. Let me take your picture, like whatever. And the, the family was like, yeah, we love this. And yes, and the other group like ran away for like out of fear, like this person's crazy. And so that can happen, right? You can bomb a joke on a Southwest airline. You can do something that doesn't work for everyone, but, but that doesn't mean don't do it. It, it means, um, how are we creating safe spaces for our employees to try things? How are we saying, let's try things? And then how do you respond in the moment? If, if the group is, runs away, yeah, hey, that's okay. And they didn't run away. They're just like, oh, no, thank you. No picture for us. So it wasn't this dramatic situation. But why I'm saying it this way is there can be a difference. And that's okay. And certainly you don't ever want to say anything offensive or use humor against anyone or any 
um, person or culture or any of that that's absolutely un uh, unacceptable. But how can you have fun with your uh, guests in, in a really positive way and, and make really nice moments and personalized experiences that people remember. It was great. The other day I was at, again, the Desert Botanical Garden and we had a big sign outside of my workshop that says private workshop. And so I walked out to go to the restroom and one of the guests was like, what's going on in that private workshop? I'm like, oh, it's painfully boring. You absolutely are so lucky you're not here. He's like, well, I want to go to the painfully boring workshop. And he said, are there mimosas? I said, you know, that is great feedback please write that on our comment cards. And then he was laughing and the wife was like, Bob, get over here and look at this cactus and stop talking to the, you know, there was just this really rich moment. And I attribute that to improv and to being in the moment and to having fun with guests in a safe, fun way and having those experiences. And if we did that, if we empowered our staff to, I mean, think of 250 people doing that all throughout the garden, like what a fun day in making these experiences personalized and unique rather than me just putting my head down and walking from point A to point B or telling people to stand behind the line or to be mindful of um, the plants. So it's about finding those moments and being yourself. You know, no one else could nail that joke or have that. So how can Josh do that? How can Matt do that? It's gonna look different for all of us. But the point is we're not having the conversation. So how can leaders have the conversation and empower people to get there? Well, I think one of the, the really cool things about that that I've noticed is that it just builds confidence, right? Yeah. The, more, the more you screw up, the more that it, some, a joke doesn't land in a safe space, you're much more likely to try it out in the field or out on the floor. Um, and so if it doesn't work with one person coming up the escalator, then you try it with the next person and you yes. tweak it a little bit. But you've already built the confidence that it's okay if it doesn't work, you know, one out of yes. 10 times or two out of 10 times. Yes. Um, so you just mentioned something really, I think, important is talking about leadership, right? Because to have the crazy lady from 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 uh, Chicago coming in and doing the, this improv stuff, that you know, it's, it's wonderful, and you you kind of outlined some of the the great stuff. But how do you sell that to your executive yeah. team? How do you how yeah. do you let them know that this is an important part of our next step in our culture? Yeah, boy, it's easier and easier when we started this work back in two thousand and six. Um, it was harder. There was recently a study th that came out that said by participating in 20 minutes of improvisational activities and exercises, you're more likely to be more tolerant of uncertain times and uncertainty. There's a lot more research out there about being empathy, listening, being vulnerable, um, playing games. I just read in a Harvard Business Review, if you're um, um, playing games with your teams, it, you're having a good time, you're creating culture. It doesn't have to be an improv game, any game. Um, there's a lot of research out there. That's one technique. Another is the positive culture angle and being able to laugh at work. And that helps with retention and that helps with employee morale. Um, it makes a workplace something that you want to be in and not dreading. No, nobody wants to get yelled at. There's just abundance more research about that as well. Um, and it's, I always start with the skill sets that we're expecting of our team members. So let's better train and empower them to succeed. This, this is a professional development opportunity so that people can be better, whether you're the CEO or whether you're guest facing staff, these things can be tailored, but at the end of the day, it's going to be more fun. It's proven by research and you're going to work essential skill sets and have a good time while you're doing it. Um, and there, there's a bunch of other facts. And for people that, that don't, I, I don't think my work is about convincing people the need of it. If that were the case, it would probably be, be hard. What's fun about my work is people are understanding and seeing how important good communication is, whether it's science communication. By the way, there's a huge absence of that in training. So in scientists, they often aren't trained to this. And so there's more and more demand for strong science communication. Or with leadership, people understand they have a negative guest culture. Man, I think we've talked about this. And like, how do we help shift this? What are some of the things that we can do? And I think shifting a culture from negative and punitive to positive. So that's a, you know, you could call that improv, but that is how do we positively reinforce people and improv is a great way to do that and looking at rules that you may have and how do we shift negatives into positives so, so there's a lot there it doesn't only have to be 
improv, but that's a great segue into thinking about what's the best application of these strategies to help your organization grow and evolve to your end goal. Yeah. Awesome. Heather, this has been uh, such a fun conversation. We, we knew it would be fun. I think it was even <laughs> more exciting and, and more engaging than uh, than we had even anticipated. As we start to wind down here, uh, if people want to get a hold of you directly, if they want to learn more about improv at work, where would you send them? To my website, which is <laughs> under construction, but always evolving. That is yet another area of my growth, uh, but it's, it's really fun. Improvisation at work.com. So that's long, I-M-P-R-O-V-I-S-A-T-I-O-N. So improvisation at at work w r w o r k <laughs> dot com and you'll um, get a little bit more context and see how improv is applied in different environments and industries and that's where you can reach me too reach me for questions you know i i love this and i i love talking about it thank you what can i ask you a question what inter interested you most about this topic and this work me or Matt? Both. <laughs> in, in improv? Yeah. So like, how did you decide? Like, let's, let's pick this for the podcast because. Matt, you want to take that? I think I can come up with a great answer, but I know Matt can probably. <laughs> my, my, my interest of course is twofold. Number one, we had to get Heather on the podcast. I mean, number uh, one, yeah, I mean, Heather and I have been friends yeah. for many <laughs> years. I know she's got so much to offer. Even if we didn't even talk about improv for the entire podcast, she would have so much to offer just in terms of, of leading and uh, positive culture and things like that. So we had to get Heather on no matter where she was in the world. But then Yay. I, I've also incorporated um, uh, different improv activities in my workshops. And I've seen the impact that they can have. Everything, if you're listening and you've been in one of my workshops, I stole everything I've ever done from Heather. So every one of those activities are something I've seen Heather do. Um, so I think what, what really interests me is, again, how it can have an impact whether it's on a, a training workshop or your overall culture or, you know, an energizer to kind of get people talking differently. I had an experience just a couple of weeks ago where we did yes. And, you know, I think one of the, you know, the most common um, improv activities and to hear people afterwards talking to other people with yes. And, you know, and they were, they were reframing mm. conversations to be more positive and to be more collaborative. And mm -hmm. it was a trigger for them, right? It was, it was, yes, we did the activity mm -hmm. and we had some fun with it, but now it was translating into other conversations mm -hmm. that were having a positive Im impact on, on the team and what they, what they felt was possible. So, um, you know, just those kind of those kind of results, I think, were, yeah. were amazing, and we had to have the expert on. Okay, well, Matt's frozen. I just have to. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, I love that. I did a workshop. Actually, Rebecca Clone came in. It was so fun. She took some pictures, and I did this workshop with faculty at a university. And then a year later, they had me come back, and I thought, okay, and and do like building on what we learned. Uh, wanted to hear what resonated with them, if anything. I mean, it was kind of in a way so I could build on the workshop and tailor it in that moment, but also self-fulfilling. Like, did they take anything away? Were they trying anything? So I asked the whole room what they took away from the first workshop. I was shocked. And so was Rebecca. She's like, oh my God. One professor was like, I always start my lectures now with an open-ended question. Another, I mean, everybody, I use yes and in my classroom, like every person had these takeaways and they were all different from one another. And that's another cool thing of improv. It's like, take what works for you, leave the rest behind. You don't have to do everything in a way that is methodical or a checklist. And it was so powerful. And then they built on those skill sets and, and uh, the evaluations were really interesting, but yeah, it, it can help begin to change really quickly, which is cool. Nice. So to add on to what Matt said, just a little bit, being able to take the topic of improv and weave it into, I would say, concepts that we we like talking on the podcast, employee engagement, guest experience, things like that, brings, uh, I would say, a unique lens that we probably haven't covered in depth before. And then like you were saying at the very beginning, that when people think of improv, they think of comedy, entertainment, or SNL, but being able to really get into the nitty gritty and the practical application of it, I think makes for uh, 
makes makes it very important for us to be able to cover this topic. So we are so appreciative of you being here today and for us to have the opportunity to chat with you about everything improv and all the, the benefits that it can have from it. And for everyone out there who is watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.